Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Regroup Conference sponsored by Louisiana Baptists. My name is Ken Braddy. I am the director of Sunday School at Lifeway Christian Resources, and this is the breakout titled Creating a New Scorecard for Groups. As we get started, I have to tell you that I love golf. If I've got a day off and not much to do, you will find me either on the driving range or out there on the course playing. My grandfather taught the game to me. I've played it uh, in my adult life. I've taught my sons how to play, and I love doing this about as much as anything. When I first began to play golf, though, I was pretty terrible, and I learned that the most important thing to focus on was that final score. And so I'd stand around the golf cart at the end of a round of golf and look at the scorecard that my three other friends and I had put together over the course of the golfing out, that golf outing, and low score wins in golf, and that was typically typically not me. And so for me, the score was everything. It, it told me if I was having a good round or if I was really on track. And most days that was not the case. I was usually the last guy, you know, in that fourth position. And then I began reading golf digest magazine and I began watching the golf channel and I discovered some pretty interesting and neat things. And that is that the score in golf is not the only way to measure the success of your golf game. In fact, what I quickly started to learn was that there are many parts of the golf game and all of them have to work together in order for you to have a pretty good day of golf. And so there were some statistics that I began to track and some things I began to learn about my golf game. One was fairways in regulation. That is always expressed as a percentage of the fairways that you hit from the tee box. So the goal obviously would not to be over to the left or to the right in the woods, but to be right down the middle in the short grass, able to find your ball. I have discovered that the higher the percentage is here, the more fairways I hit, the better chance I've got of having a lower score at the end of the round. And then I discovered greens and regulation, which is an expression of how many greens do I hit in regulation shots from the fairway. And I've discovered here, the more I hit, the higher the percentage of greens that I hit, the lower my score typically is. And then there is the number of putts. I'd like to see that as low as possible because that's where I can quickly pick up some score and lower my score. And so number of putts was something that I tracked. And then the number of sand saves. You know, when your ball is in a greenside bunker, can you get it out? Can you get it onto the green, make your putt, save your par, and then move on? What I discovered, everybody, was that whenever I had a round of golf, I might not have scored so good but there were certain parts of my game that were actually pretty good. And so let's, let's just kind of think this through. If my fairways in regulation, that percentage of shots from the tee box that are actually finding the short grass, if that was pretty high, and that was a good thing to have a high percentage of that happening, but if my score was also high, that told me that there was something wrong in my game. It was not this. And so then I start looking at my greens in regulation, GIR, and maybe I was just having a bad day with my golf irons and I was not hitting the ball from the short grass to the green. Or maybe I was doing both of those things well, but perhaps my putting just fell apart and I three and I four putted all day. And that's what caused my score to climb. And so when I began thinking of golf in these compartments, then all of a sudden I could come off of a golf course, even if the day and the score, you know, had not gone the way I wanted I could still look and find aspects of my golf game that were actually okay that day, but it also told me that I needed to work on these other areas where I had not done so well. And I began to wonder, could that be applied? Could that, that those principles and philosophy of golf be applied to groups? And I think they can. And so uh, what I want to tell you today is that in golf, uh, just like uh, in group life, uh, there's a way to measure things. And in golf, 
there's more than one way to measure your success besides that final score. But in Bible study, there's also more to group ministry and success than just attendance. Attendance has tended to be like the score in golf. It's the thing that we've all looked at all these years to see how our groups are doing. And honestly, folks that have smaller groups have sometimes tended to think they weren't doing things quite right or their group would be bigger. That's not true. Sometimes bigger things are not helpful healthier things. And so I use that as a framework for this new book that has just come out, it's just been released, called Breakthrough, Creating a New Scorecard for Group Ministry Success. And yes, the book is built around that golf motif. So this is what I want us to look at today. And I want us to think through what are those things that groups must do to have a, a good round, so to speak, to borrow that golf term. And so as we think about it, there are four measurements for group success that I believe are very important for groups. Number one is to learn and obey God's word. That's one of the four big things that we want to see groups doing. It's not just enough to learn God's word. We want to learn and we want to obey God's word. There's a big difference. If I'm just learning it, I'm being taught factoids, or if I'm the teacher, I'm teaching factoids. But if I'm learning and obeying, now I'm looking at how God's word is transforming my life and the life of those people in my group. The second big thing that we want to measure is whether or not we're inviting people to become disciples. That's just a longer way of saying the word evangelism. Are we doing this as teachers and are we doing this? Are we leading our people to do this as group members? Number next, number three, we want to form deeper relationships. And this means two things. It means, are we forming relationships with the people in our group? Or are we just a group of people coming together from four different zip codes on Sunday morning for about an hour? And then we scatter back to our four zip codes for the rest of the week never to engage one another again. So we want to know, are we making deeper relationships with the people in our group, but also are we forming relationships with the people outside of our group, people who are not yet believers, not yet church members? We'll talk more about that here in a moment. And then number four, are we engaging in acts of service? We think about our groups, and this also means two things. It means are we engaging in service in the church? Are we releasing our people and encouraging our people to go off and to leave our group and to serve? They become missionaries to preschoolers and kids and to students. Maybe they even become a missionary to adults by starting another adult group down the hall from us. So we want to know, are we serving inside the church as a class? Are we fostering that. And then the second part of this is, are, is the group serving outside of the church, outside of the physical address and the property and the buildings of our church? Is the group making any measurable difference in our community? And so these are the things that we want to look at. Now in the book, these are the four big sections. And in each section, there are four chapters that ask four different questions. And so that's what I want to look at uh, are those, those four questions and these four big measurements. And once we get through, we should be able to put together a new scorecard for groups that moves us beyond just attendance. And so let's think about this first measurement, learning and obeying God's word. So chapter one, ask that first question, are group members maturing as disciples? Well, how would we know if they are maturing as disciples? It's a great question. If we're teaching and if we're teaching for information, we might not be seeing the transformation that, that has to happen if we're going to be disciple-making teachers. And so we're asking this first question, are group members maturing and dis as disciples? And there's one word that is used over and over again in the scripture for this life of discipleship, and it's the word walk. You can see it in both Testaments. I've given you just a few examples here where Paul tells us you know, to walk worthy of the calling that we have, and other passages say similar things. But I think my favorite passage is this last one here, Genesis 5, 
where we have an entire chapter that goes into history and lineage of people's families. And it says in there, so-and-so begat so-and-so. And so it tells you who married who and how many kids they had and who their descendants were. And it's just a run-on chapter of that kind of thing until you get down to Genesis 5.21, and a new character is introduced by the name of Enoch, and I'm sure that you're familiar with the character of Enoch. The fascinating thing is that in everybody who is above him in this chapter, it just says that they lived, they died, and they, you know, they had children, they were named, you know, XYZ, and then they died, they rested with their fathers, and it just goes on to introduce the next person. But when you get to chapter uh, 5 and verse 21, it was only said of Enoch in this chapter that Enoch walked with God. And so that tells me there must be something slightly different than just living and then living and walking with God. So those are two different two different things. So what we want to know is what does that mean look like in the life of a disciple to walk with God? Well, Thankfully, LifeWay is really great at commissioning a lot of research, and we commissioned the largest project, the largest research project on discipleship in North America several years ago, and in the survey, we discovered that there are eight signposts, eight indicators that a person was on the pathway of discipleship. These were things, eight things that you could see in the lives of believers who were growing and maturing. We would want to see those in our life and the lives of our group members. And so here we go. Here are the eight pretty quickly. But we have to ask that question. Are our members maturing as disciples? Well, here's how we know. The first one, the first indicator is that they obey God and they deny self. This is the mark of a maturing disciple. So if you were to say to your group, we, it's time for us to plant another group, the person in your group that is obeying God and denying self raises their hand and they say, you know, I don't really want to leave this group. I love you, my teacher, and I love the people in this group, but I know that God has called us to reach people with the gospel. So I'm going to go down the hall. I'll take my wife with me and a few of you group members that want to go, and I will go start a brand new group, and I won't be able to be a part of this one anymore. I'll deny myself that privilege, even though I thoroughly enjoy it. I'm going to go and start another group because that's what God has told us to do. We're to go and make disciples. So that's one way that somebody would live that out. Number two, a growing disciple is someone who engages with scripture. We found in the survey that this is the single most important factor in whether or not a person is growing and postured to grow year over year as a disciple. There is nothing that even compares and comes close. And so as group leaders, we want to make sure that our people are reading their Bible between Sundays. A lot of life happens from Sunday to Sunday, and discipleship doesn't take a week off. And so we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to encourage the reading of God's Word daily. Number three, they share Christ. That's pretty uh, pretty self-explanatory, right? They, they know the gospel, they know how to share it, and they are bold in their faith. Doesn't mean they're obnoxious. Doesn't mean that they are, you know, yelling and screaming and preaching on the street corner or fire, you know, hellfire and brimstone kind of a message. But what they do do is they look for opportunities in their daily walk to share the gospel. That may be someone in the family. It could be someone that they work with, or if their children are engaged in sports or uh, other uh, extracurricular activities, as they hang out with those fellow parents, they're watching for those moments when they can insert the gospel. They can introduce spiritual conversations. Number four, they exercise faith. Now, this, this photo has always gotten my stomach. I have no doubt this, this has to be Photoshop. Nobody would do this. But this fellow is exercising a big leap. He's taking a huge leap of faith here. Well, this is what growing disciples do. It might express itself this way. Your pastor stands up one day and announces that your church next summer is going to take a mission trip to South America. 
and he encourages you to start going ahead and lining up passports if you don't have them to request the time off from work, to go see your doctor and maybe uh, get the shots that you might have to have to go out of country, a person could say, you know what, I, I don't want to do that. That sounds scary. It sounds dangerous. I've never been out of the country. But then the Holy Spirit speaks to them and they say, you know what, I'm going to go on that mission trip. And so they go ask for the time off. They go see their doctor and they get the appropriate inoculations. And they maybe even you know, learn a language that's going to be spoken at the place where the mission trip is going to take place. And so they exercise faith. They won't cower in the corner. They will actually get out there because they realize God goes with them. So they exercise faith. Number five, they seek God. And we find this primarily in the way that they approach worship. They are very committed to the weekly worship of your church and with their fellow believers, but they may also seek God privately, like we said earlier, and they engage with scripture, but they seek God. Number six, they build relationships. This is really critical. And they are looking for ways to have relationships with people that are in the existing group, but they're also concerned with bringing new people into the group and finding new people, new friends, new group members that need the gospel. So they're very happy to build relationships outside of your church family and maybe outside of your group. They build relationships. Number seven, they live unashamed. This is somewhat related to sharing the gospel, but they are not afraid to get involved and to let you know that they are Christ followers. They may wear the t-shirt, the jewelry. Uh, younger folks today might even have a tattoo that they use to start conversations about the gospel. Maybe it's the Christian fish symbol, the ichthus, or something else. A Bible. I've seen several folks that have Bible verses on their wrist or on their arms, and that's what they're there for. They're to live unashamed and to have those conversations. Number eight, and the last of the eight signs that uh, you are maturing as a believer is that the person serves God and they serve others. And so you find that uh, taking place in the life of a maturing believer. So as we think about uh, this learning and obeying God's word as being one of the measurements of our groups, we're asking that question, are group members maturing as disciples? If we can see these eight signs, these eight signposts in them, then yes, we are helping our group members to mature, and that is a good thing. If we don't see those happening or we don't see some of those things happening, then as a group leader, it, it lets me know how I might want to fashion and, 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 and form the Bible studies that we're going to be doing as a group so that we're addressing some of those that I think the group is a little bit weaker in. It helps me know how to disciple my people. Chapter 2 and question 2, are Bible studies well-prepared? and engaging. I have to tell you that our LifeWay website spikes a couple of times a week with great regularity. One is on Saturday evening, and we believe that is because people are looking for content for Sunday morning. They have not yet prepared their Bible studies. It's after 6 p.m., and there's a mad rush to get a Bible study prepared. But even worse than that, it spikes a second time, and that is on Sunday morning. And so you can imagine the quality of those Bible studies probably not being so great. And if they're not great, then the people in the group are not want, they're not going to want to come and learn to, uh, you know, learn the word and learn to obey it because the Bible studies are just not well prepared. They're not put together well. Uh, the questions that are asked or the activities just fall short. And maybe the teacher does not have a good grasp of the scripture. So one of the things that we can do to make sure that we are helping people learn and obey God and his word is to make sure that we are not handicapping our group by not preparing the way we should. Uh, Vince Lombardi said this, he said, the will to win is not nearly so important as the will to prepare to win. He's exactly right. Uh, Robert Pasmino, who is a Christian educator, someone that I follow, I've got most of his books. He said this, that preparation can be viewed as an act of love and a form of worship that seeks to give glory to God. That's a that's a wonderful way to think about my preparation as a group leader all throughout the week, not on Saturday evening, not on Sunday morning, but starting my preparation early 
even Sunday afternoon early, as I've already taught Sunday morning, I'm now starting to look ahead to the next week's Bible study. So those are the first two. Number three, chapter three, question three, are apprentice leaders identified and developed? We know that apprenticeship has had a very long history a history that has dated back as far as Egypt and Babylon. And apprentices were developed so that the skills could be passed down from one craftsman to another, a lot of times from father to son or from mother to daughter. And by doing this, uh, they ensured that the society was going to have enough artisans that would serve the needs of the greater society. And so apprenticeship has been around for a, a long time, but I'm going to say this, and uh, you can mark my words, and we can look at this a year or two from now and go back, but I'm going to say that apprentice leaders will be the future of our Bible study groups. They are going to make or break our, stu our Bible study ministries because we cannot start new groups and we cannot expand what we're doing without apprentice leaders that have been trained to do what we do. Apprentice leaders are going to help us in four different ways. They are going to keep our group's attention focused outward. Because the biggest sign that a group is living out the Great Commission and they're willing and ready to start another group is that they've got an apprentice leader who is trained to do that. Number two, the, the apprentice leader is going to help prevent leadership voids. They are going to be able to step in when a group leader says, I need a break or I need a bigger break, like a sabbatical break, because I've been teaching for you know years or decades, and it keeps when a, a leader moves away, uh, they just have to transfer to a new city or someone retires. There's a void there. The apprentice steps in, and there's not a hole. The group moves on, and everything is well. Number three, they help the church reach new people, and they do that primarily by starting those new groups. And as people see their example, their selfless example, they encourage others to lead as well. And so it's a good thing, apprentice leaders, but most of our churches do not have apprentice leaders in their groups. They might have a substitute leader, a substitute, but that is a very different person besides this apprentice leader. The substitute teacher teaches one-off lessons when the Bible studies group leader is not available. Maybe they're sick that day or out of town because of work. But the apprentice leader, they're teaching every three to four weeks or so with great regularity. Why? Because they are being groomed to be comfortable in front of the group, to know how to lead the group. And that is a good thing. And so that's how those two people, the substitute and the apprentice, are so different. Most of our groups, we need apprentices. We need to call other people alongside us, teach them how to do what we do, and in so doing, we can multiply our groups for our church. Are they have our, our group leaders, our apprentice leaders identified and developed? Number four in this section, and then we'll turn the corner to the second big goal of groups, the second big measurement. But in this section, we want to ask this question, are new groups started with regularity? Because if they're not, our Bible study ministries most likely are not going to grow. New groups are on average are going to add about 10 people to your Sunday school ministry or whatever you may call it. So one group, 10 new people. They will help a church overcome its churn, which is the number of people that leave the church in the course of a year. Some leave because they get mad. Maybe they heard something in a sermon they didn't like, or maybe they had a crisis and they didn't feel like they were cared for. Whatever it is, they may move off because of a job change. Uh, there's churn in every church. Typically, it's between 10 and 20 percent. And so if we want to grow our Bible study ministry, we also have to cover the churn that is taking place before we actually grow. So let's just say in our church, let's say of 100 people, that 10 people this year are going to leave because of churn. Well, if I wanted to grow 10 people this next year, I first have to fill the hole that the churn caused. So in reality, I probably need to start two groups, one to cover the churn, one for me to grow 10 people. These new groups almost always grow faster than established groups. My wife and I have started two groups 
in two different churches here in Middle Tennessee, where we live. And in both cases, we flew past the groups that were in existence. Why? It's not because I was the best or strongest teacher in the church. It was because there was something new and they began to advertise. There's a new adult group. People that had not been in groups said, well, let's go give it a try. They began to send the guests of our church to this new group. And all of a sudden we flew past, we got to about 35, 36 members of our group relatively quickly. And the people wanted to know, what have you done to do this? Well, nothing really other than we started the new group. New attracts new people. Number four, uh, most new groups, they tend to be more evangelistic and more outwardly focused than groups that have been together for two or more years. And then they always have a positive financial impact on the church. Uh, we have said that even in a church with a per capita giving of $20 or so per person, one new group should add somewhere between eleven dollars and $13,000 to the church's annual tithes and offerings. If you started two groups and you attracted 10 new people on average, all of a sudden your church's tithes and offerings should rise between twenty-two and twenty-four or five thousand dollars, it's just a side benefit and a blessing of doing the Great Commission. As we reach new people, as they start to mature, as they learn the importance of giving, they do. And then all of a sudden, we look up, and our churches are able to afford new staff, more programming. They can send kids to camp, launch some local ministries. All those things, just because we've been obedient to start new groups as an expression of our obedience to the Great Commission. And then number last here, new groups help the church overcome the Lego factor. Now, you're probably very familiar with these little toys. Uh, if you've ever stepped on one during the night, to say your kids didn't pick them up, it hurts. These are nasty little things to step on because they've got those knobs on them. And you can see the two longer uh, rectangular ones, the yellow and the red and the orange, they've got about eight connectors those little connecting knobs on them. And I want to use that as an illustration to say that most relationship experts would tell you that we can handle about six to eight serious relationships. Well, here's what happens when groups have been together for longer than two years, the people in those groups, they get legoed up together, they get connected together. And when a new person comes into the group looking for relationships, not just Bible study, they're looking to make some friends, all of a sudden, they say, you know, well, this group's not very friendly. Well, the group would say of itself, we're absolutely friendly, and they are to one another. But that new person comes in wanting some new friends, and there's no place relationally for them to connect. But in the new groups, in those newer groups, they have the people in there have not all been legoed up with one another yet. And so that is a perfect place to send your visitors, send them to those newest groups. All right, well, that was section one of the book and of our content today. Here's measurement number two. This is the I in the life acrostic. Invite people to become disciples. Again, this is evangelism. So we want to ask this question, are our prayers focused on the lost? David Francis, who was our former uh, director of Sunday school, uh, he, he outlined three levels of prayer that he says you'll you'll see and hear in your bible study groups he said the first is the class level and he said that's the really safe prayers this is you know pray for my uh my cat i gotta floss the cat today and he's not gonna like it so pray for us it's gonna be rough uh pray for my aunt Susie stub toe pray for world peace it's those kinds of things you typically hear those when the groups are newer and people don't know each other and they've not yet let their guard down but then at the community level as the group's been together for a while they uh, begin to share more intimate prayer requests they have formed a small community of believers inside your church and so now you start hearing prayers like you know, pray for us as a family because we're considering a move because of, you know, the husband or the wife's job and career path or because of aging parents. And uh, somebody else might say, you know, I've got a, a, a family member who does not go to church. They're lost. Uh, would you help us pray for that person? You began to hear those things. But then David says the place that we, we love to see groups get is when they get to the commission level. And yes, that is the great commission level where you hear prayer like this. There's a new fellow at my work. He's about two cubicles down. 
I kind of hear the way he talks and I think I can, can, you know, extrapolate how this guy lives. Don't think he's connected to the Lord and maybe even to a church. So this Wednesday class, I'm going to take him to lunch and we're going to sit down and, and I'm going to try to hear his story. I'm going to try to share my spiritual story. And maybe if the Lord opens the door, I'm going to share the gospel. Would you pray for me to have boldness? You start hearing those kinds of prayers at the commission level. And you start hearing your group praying for lost people. That is a wonderful thing to happen. Few groups get there. But when they do, you know that you are on the right track for inviting people to become disciples. Chapter six, question six. Are group members eating with sinners and tax collectors? I love this chapter in the book. I try to practice this. I don't think that I'm where I want to be just yet. But we want to have an outward focus and to ask ourselves, who do we know that are, you know, these people are living away from the Lord? They're not connected with the church. Uh, they, they, they probably are not saved. Uh, maybe have never darkened the door of a church, but those are the kinds of people that God has placed us on the planet to reach. You will remember that Jesus was criticized for this. The Pharisees uh, just clobbered him over his time that he was spending with sinners and tax collectors. They asked his disciples, hey, what's your rabbi doing by hanging out with these, you know, these seedy, uh, unwanted kind of people? And Jesus heard about this, and he, he told the Pharisees, look, I've come not for the healthy. I've come for the sick. The, the, the healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. And he said, my mission is to be here and to bring healing to the spiritually sick. And if that was the mission, then certainly is the mission now. And our group members and we as group leaders must set that example and tell stories of how we're eating with sinners and tax collectors that we know in our lives. It's a wonderful thing when it happens. Number seven, chapter seven, question seven, are new persons invited to connect with the group? And this is something that our groups must do a better job of. I've actually been in two groups as a guest, just as a visitor. No one knows, no one knew that I worked for Lifeway or that I had a, a job that had national implications. I was just John Doe Schmo, I was just, you know, unchurched, you know, the unchurched hairy guy that comes in and says, Hey, I'm here for Bible study. And I can't tell you how many times I've done that and just been incognito and never been invited back to the group. I've been to groups where nobody spoke to me in the course of the entire hour of Bible study. And then we just all got up and left and walked and went to church. And folks, that's a terrible thing. It sends a terrible message. And so as a Bible study leader myself, whenever we had new people coming into our group, they were guests for that first Sunday, we probably went overboard in inviting them to connect with our group. I wanted them to know that we wanted them there, that we were concerned about their spiritual growth, and we wanted them to, to know that we would love it if they would connect with our group, because if they did, it meant that their children would connect with the group that they were in. It would be good for the entire family. And then chapter eight and question eight, are our group members initiating gospel conversations? Are they actually doing that hard work, the work that we've all been called to do, go and make disciples? That's not just for pastors. That's not just for church, church staff. That was given to the, the capital C church. And so every one of us, every person in our Bible study groups should come alongside our pastor and our staffs, and to take on this responsibility. Just because I don't have, let's say, the gift of giving, that does not excuse me from giving financially to my church and surrendering my tithes and offerings. I could say, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism, but that doesn't mean I'm off the hook. We are all on the hook for initiating those gospel conversations. Arthur Flake, who was the first director of Sunday school, the Sunday school superintendent is what they called him back in 1920, made this statement. He said the supreme business of Christianity is to win the loss to Christ. That's what churches are for. It was Christ's supreme mission. And surely then the Sunday school must relate itself to the winning of the loss to Christ as an ultimate objective. Of course, he was absolutely correct. And here's what I have discovered, that people in our groups will share their the gospel message if they know two things. They need to know, number one, how to articulate the essentials of their story. You might say their testimony. 
I like the word story. It's just a little simpler. It's a little less technical sounding. So how to share their story. And here are the three elements of anybody's story. It's what was my life like before I met Jesus? Number two, how did I come about you know, accepting him as my savior? Was that at church? Uh, was that in my home privately? Was it at an event? Uh, you know, if I'm a teenager, was it at summer camp or something like this? And then number three, what's life been like after that? How has Jesus made a difference in my life? How am I growing? What am I learning? How am I a different person? So if the folks in our groups know this, they are about halfway there to having the confidence to share the gospel. Then they have to know, number two, a plan for sharing the gospel. And this is the one that I have taught every Bible study group that I've led. I, I like Romans 6.23. The navigators use this, and they call it one-verse evangelism. Matter of fact, if you have a smartphone, you can go to your app store and search for one-verse evangelism, and yes, there is an app for that. And you can simply, if you can swipe to the left, it will walk you through a gospel presentation. You just turn the phone around so that the other person can see it, you're swiping, it'll do the work for you. But this is so simple that I have taught group members how to do this. Both, uh, we, we've practiced both sharing our testimonies in class and this simple verse. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I ask a few questions when I'm sharing the gospel using this verse. I ask the person, hey, what's a wage? The Bible says there's a wage being paid. And what is that? And they say, well, it's something that you're owed. And I said, exactly. Uh, the wages is something, the wages that we get, there's something that we're owed, just like we go to work and we're, our, our employer owes us a paycheck. But I said, here it says there's a wage of sin. I said, what is sin? They'll typically say, well, that's doing bad things. And I'll say, you know, it's that. It's, it's, it's not doing the things that God tells us to, and it's doing things you know, that he says not to do. And, and so the wages, I said, the payment for the sin that we do is what? And they say it's death. And I say, well, what does that mean? What is death? And what I lead them to understand is that is a place where there's no hope. There's no help. And then if I've written this down, let's say on a napkin or a sheet of paper, I circle the word but because the truth always comes after that. And as I ask them again, what's a gift? And they say, well, that's something you get for free. You don't earn it, people just give it to you. And I say, exactly. What does it say the gift is here? And who does it come from? They say, well, it comes from God. And I said, I would say, yeah, and what is the gift? And they just read on, they say, well, it says eternal life. Then I ask them, what does that mean? And they say, well, Maybe I'm not quite sure. I say, well, that is a place of hope. That is a place of help. That is a place in God's presence where we're okay. He's fully accepted and forgiven us. But then I circle the next word, the word in. And I tell them the little word in reminds me that I must be in a relationship with Jesus. And then I ask them if they would like to pray. Do they understand what I've just shared with them? And if they do, I pray that sinner's prayer with them. And if they say, nah, I'm a little fuzzy, I just go back through this again, no problem. But this is a verse that I have used, and I have discovered when my people know how to, sh how to share their story and then how to share the gospel with this verse, they'll do it. And this is where I began to see us making some progress in my group. Measurement number three is forming deeper relationships. That's the F in the life acrostic. Now, Jim Putman, who is not Southern Baptist, but he is an excellent thought leader in the, the realm of discipleship, he made that statement in his book, Discipleship. He said, Jesus' primary method for making disciples, bringing people into uh, a, a, an eternal relationship with him, it was done life on life. It was like one on one. And there were moments in the scripture, you know, where Jesus did it 5,000 on one. The Sermon on the Mount would be an example of that. But how many of those did he do? If that was the way to make disciples, wouldn't he have done that? And the gospels would just be filled with stories of him teaching on hillsides to the masses. His typical day was spent with him walking the dusty roads of Judea with his disciples, running into people, those divine appointments, uh, spending time with his 12 disciples and his inner group of three. And that's how he made disciples. The sequoia tree, uh, interestingly enough, was uh, just literally coming out of the ground 2,000 years ago 
when Jesus and his disciples were walking in Judea. These monstrous trees these days that we could go see in California were just little sprigs coming out of the ground. And now they are, it would take 20 or 30 of us holding hands to ring a tree like that. And these trees go 300 or more feet tall. Can you even imagine how deep the root systems must be in these trees to support them? Well, the trick here is that they're not very deep. Four to five feet, that's it. And when I first heard that, I thought, I mean, my my first thought was, A, no way, and B, why would God build a tree that big and that tall with five feet root systems? That makes zero sense. These things just, there's no way that they could possibly stand. And here's the deal. They typically never grow alone because the root systems are not deep enough. But how God designed this tree to grow and to live and to survive and to thrive was to grow next to another tree like it. And the root systems are not deep, but they are broad. They reach out and they find the root system of the tree next to them. And then they twist and tangle up and they hold on to one another for dear life. Folks, this is the best illustration that I've ever seen of what group life in our Bible study groups should be. We should be tangling our lives with the lives of the people in our group, not just coming together for an interesting Bible study, but doing life together and tangling our lives, much like these root systems do with other trees. We tangle ourselves relationally with other people in our Bible study groups. That's when our Bible study groups become wonderful places where people experience deep community. And that's what we must have. We form those deeper relationships. Is the group organized to care for people? That's the qu first question here uh, that we're going to ask in this section. It's chapter nine of our, our 16, uh, 16 chapters. So is the group organized to care for people? Uh, we want to make sure that no one falls through cracks, that no one feels unimportant. We have to ask, is our Bible study group organized? Do we have care group leaders? Do we have enough people helping the group leader look after the people that are in their group. Chapter number 10, question 10, how balanced are connection and content? If we want to form deeper relationships, our Bible study groups cannot all be about, you know, just mainly about the teaching of God's word. That is very important. But we also must recognize that people need relationships and they need each other. In too many groups, that's what it looks like. Very heavy on content, you're great expositors of God's word, but how many times does the group not get together in the course of three months or six months? Or does your group have regular community building opportunities outside of the class? Do you go to lunch on Sunday together? Do you go and take a day trip on a Saturday together? Do you have a game night? Do you have a night where you just come together to have some snacks and to pray together? Do you see folks pairing off and doing things as couples or families? We have to lead our groups to create opportunities for us to have community because like those big sequoia trees, we need each other. God has designed us to grow in proximity to one another. Kerry Niehoff has made this statement. I think he's exactly right. He says that growing churches, now he's talking now and post-COVID, will realize that connection and community will win out over content in the end. And then he says, nobody should be able to out local or out community the local church. What he means by this is that you can go online today and find great messages from some great preachers, but what you're not going to get is that one-on-one, -on -one, flesh on flesh relationship with another human being. God has designed us for that. Genesis 2.18 says, it was not good that the man was alone, and so God created Eve. He created a helper and a companion, and we still have that hole. We've got this God-sized hole in our heart and our lives that we need God, but we also have this human-sized hole because we need what other people do not do well in isolation. Chapter 11, question 11, do newcomers experience biblical hospitality? Well, what is that? It is simply treating a stranger like they are a friend. And many of our groups could do better in this arena. I have literally, like I said earlier, visited groups all over the country in 
churches of varying sizes, small, medium, large, and extra large. And I've been in those Bible study groups, and it is not, it was not uncommon for me to sit in the group and for no one, and I mean no one that morning to say a word to me. They talked amongst themselves. They obviously had a friendly group. They'd been together for a while. They knew each other, but they were either afraid of me, didn't care about me. They thought maybe, well, somebody else has already talked to the guy, but we want to make sure that we are practicing biblical hospitality. How do we do that? Recruit somebody in your group or some bodies to be a host or hostess or hosts and hostesses in your group. I had this in one of my Bible study groups and, and the couple that we enlisted made all the difference. They were always hawks looking for that new person to come in. As soon as they did, they were aggressively friendly, went up to them, introduced themselves, introduced them to other people in our Bible study group, helped them make connections. Number two, invite that guest to go to lunch. Everybody is going to eat. And so invite them to go to lunch. Doesn't mean you got to pay. It just means you're saying, hey, we want to spend some time with you. Number three, make sure you got enough chairs. I visited groups where there was not no, no extra chairs and they had to send somebody down the hall to find a chair. What does that communicate? Kate, they weren't expecting a guest. It was about their four and no more. And so we want to make sure that we've got that plus extra study guides. I've been in groups where the group was studying one of the Lifeway curriculum series. Everybody had a study guide. And then my wife and I, the guests, we were not offered a study guide. Maybe they thought, well, we're just going to be there that day. They didn't want to waste one. Maybe they just didn't think we needed it. I don't know. But you want to make sure that you've got extra study guides so that the people that are guests can keep up with and, and look at the same book that everybody else in the group is looking at. Number five, this is a huge one. Where name tags. If you don't do anything else, do this one. And I'm not talking about uh, the, the magnetic backed kind. I'm talking about the cheap ones that say, hello, my name is. And every Sunday you write names on those and everybody wears them. I made my two groups do this. I, I was challenged by one of the group members who said, I don't think we need to keep doing this because we know each other. And I said, we're not wearing them for each other. We're wearing them because it, a, it is a sign that we're expecting God to send us somebody and B, I said, when that person comes, we want to make sure that they are able to call us by name and that we can call them by name. And we, we don't forget their name because that's terrible when that happens. And so we want to make sure that name tags are a part of what we're doing. And that kind right there is just fine. Number 12, our micro groups, strengthening relationships. Micro groups are simply same sex groups of two or three or so people that come together for a little higher accountability. They let their hair down a little more than they would in the bigger group. And they are giving each other permission to challenge them in their walk with Christ, to ask some hard questions. Have you gotten angry this week? Did you look at something inappropriate on online? Are you tithing regularly? Are you spending some time daily with the Lord? And in micro groups of two, three, or maximum of four people, that can happen, and they will strengthen the group, and it goes back up to this letter F that helps the people in the group to form those deeper relationships. It's almost like an imitation-based discipleship. As we come together for that higher-level accountability in a micro group, Yes, we're probably going to do some additional studying and whatnot, but where I'm going to grow as a disciple is as I listen to you over the course of a year, talk about how you handle the potential layoff at your company or a crisis that's come up in your family. And I go, oh, that's how a believer is supposed to handle that. And you are teaching me by your example. That's why microgroups are so great. It would interest you to know, I'm sure that we have a study tool called the Daily Discipleship Guide. It is an alternate study, an alternate version of the classic, um, you might call it the quarterly or that personal study guide. But in this one, we actually have built in that feature that you see here, the talk it out, that is actually designed for a small group, two, three or four people to take their study guide, this Daily Discipleship Guide, take it to a Panera Bread or a McDonald's for breakfast. And as they have had their Bible study, as they have read the scriptures and they have continued their study during the week, now they can come together in a group of two, three or four same sex people. And there's additional questions, additional things for them to chew on as they walk with Christ. And so that's a built-in feature now in the daily discipleship guide. 
let me go back right there. Here we go. Number, uh, whoa, I jumped ahead a lot. Number four, uh, this measurement number four, and this is the, where we're going to wrap up today. Uh, engage in acts of service. The E in engage, that's the E in the life acrostic. So we've learned that we need to learn and obey God's word. We need to invite others to become disciples. We want to form deeper relationships. And now finally, it's going to round our group out. We want to make sure that our group is not just sitting and soaking, but that we're actually getting up and doing something because of our faith and relationship with Christ. So we're going to engage in acts of service. So here is the last of the four questions that we're going to ask about our group. Number one here in chapter 13 is the group making a difference in the community. Do we have anything going on outside the address of our church? Are we engaged with a local school? Are we uh, are we painting their playground? Are we providing meals or gifts for teachers? Are we going in and doing after school or maybe even during school reading programs? Are we engaging with them so that they know that we care? Or are we showing up at a crisis pregnancy center to help man the phones or to counsel? Or are we helping the local food or clothes closet to restock their shelves and to get things organized? There are so many ways that our group can make a difference beyond the address of our church. And if we're not, then we're not really fully completing these, these major tasks of groups that help us grow, we know. And in fact, we looked earlier, this is the last, this is number eight of those attributes of discipleship, growing disciples serve. So we want to point our people this direction. But not only do we want to serve in the community, number 14 and chapter 14, question 14, our group members, are we encouraging them to serve in the church? Now, listen, I'm going to step on toes here just for a few minutes. The, the groups in our churches that are the most successful groups release their people and encourage their people to go and to serve in other ministries of the church. We, we launch missionaries to kids, missionaries to students. Maybe we even launch missionaries to adults by have, sending somebody out and a husband-wife team, and maybe they take a few couples with them. They go start another group down the hall or at a different time on Sunday morning. We want to encourage that. We do not want to hold on to the people in our groups. The primary source of volunteers for the church come right of our they come right out of our adult bible study groups and so a friend of mine named daryl eldridge made this statement when he was training my teachers 25 years ago and this this was just burned into my brain by god and daryl made that statement to my teachers 25 years ago and he said the sunday school the adult sunday school is not a storehouse it's a clearing house and he challenged my teachers at that time and i'm so glad that he did to not think of success as if I've got the biggest group in the church, but my success lies in how many people have, our group has sent out and launched into ministry in our church. So we've asked, are we making a difference in the community? Are we encouraging people to serve in the church? Number 15, are people serving on the group's leadership team? What a great laboratory, what a great place for believers to practice and use their spiritual gifts. As group leaders, we need people to come alongside us and be prayer leaders, to be ministry project leaders, to look for places for us to serve in the community. We need people to come alongside us and be care group leaders. We need people to come alongside maybe as a, a class director, uh, somebody that has a, 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 the administrative side of the class so that I, the teacher, can focus on the teaching part. So we want to include folks in the leadership of the group. I don't need to do everything as a group leader. And there are some leadership roles that we could have in our groups. The teacher, of course, as the group gets bigger, someone to direct, and they would literally enlist everybody from number three down. We could have class leaders, a prayer leader, a fellowship leader, that's so important, ministry project leaders, the outreach leader, and the care group leaders. Plenty of things to do inside the group. It gives people practice, and it allows them to use their spiritual gifting. And then finally, does the group support and pray for the pastor and staff? That is an act of service, everybody. Our pastors have had a difficult two years 
as they have guided our churches through COVID, no one prepared them for this. They have been yelled at and barked at. They have probably been sent notes and letters, anon those wonderful anonymous kind, because they either didn't say enough or they said too much about the vaccines, the jabs. We went through a terrible political season about a year or so ago, and churches often divided along political lines, and they have literally had the slats kicked out of their fence. And the one thing that we can do as an act of service as our group is to send kind notes, encouraging notes, encouraging words, send that email, provide a gift, maybe a gift card for the pastor and his family, go over and cut his grass and do his lawn maintenance one week or do it for a month and give him a break and let him be encouraged and let your staff be encouraged by this. But we need to engage in acts of service. And I've just given you those four any group can do these four. So when we do all these things, now we have created this new scorecard for groups. And this is how we will evaluate ourselves as we go forward. This leads to balanced ministry, balanced Sunday school, healthier groups. It's what we should have been doing all along. And now as we come out of COVID, here's our chance to hit reset and to start doing things that we should have already been doing. That's creating a new scorecard for group ministry success. I do hope that you might go pick up a copy of the book and read it. This was a quick overview of the content, so much more in the book. And may I say, as I close out, that I have chosen not to take any royalty on the book. If we sell one or 10,001 or 100,001, I make zero. So I'm not encouraging to pick up the book so I can make a make a quick buck. I am encouraging to go, go pick it up because I think it will make a difference for you and for your Bible study group. Thank you for being a part of this event. And I pray God's blessing on you as a group leader, on your group and all of your group members and on your church and your pastors. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. Ken Brady here at Lifeway, uh, Director of Sunday School. Thank you for being a part of this. And I thank your state staff and Sean Keith and Jeff Ingram and others for inviting me to come in and to be a part of this. God bless.